Good morning, everybody. I'm Nick Ball and welcome to TMTV. Uh, this is our seventh broadcast now in uh, the last four weeks since we've been running this, uh, this program. Um, the first few weeks we did a, a few seminars on customer experience. Um, if you uh, like to like our page on T, uh, LinkedIn on TMTV, you'll get to actually view all of those broadcasts that we've had so far. Um, most importantly, there is a chat facility, as you know, if you're, I'm sure you're all familiar with Zoom right now. There's a chat facility at the bottom of the page. Please do ask any questions um, and we will try our best to get through them in the limited time that we have available today. Uh, we've already had a number of questions come through for, for our audience. Um, this is potentially the largest audience that we've actually had on TMT so far for the two heavyweights in the property sector. Rob Hailstone. Rob's an ex-residential property conveyancer with over 40 years experience. He formed Bold Legal Group in 2010 and Bold now has approximately 700 member firms all of all different shapes and sizes throughout England and Wales. BLG members are kept informed about all relevant conveyancing issues, SRA fraud alerts, law society practice notes, GDPR, um, and the government's current attempt to improving the home buying and selling process, but last uh, but not least, surviving this current environment. Michael Day is a well-known figure in the property industry with also 40 years experience. Michael is a fellow of RACS, he's, a direct, he's held director positions at AC Frost, Prudential and Connells. Michael formed Integra Property Services in 2003, providing a range of business consulting, mentoring, training and marketing services to the property industry. And Integra in that time has won many numerous Supplier of the Year's awards. Michael also has in excess of 850 plus clients and it's a bit of a who's who of the estate agency world. So good morning, gentlemen. Welcome to TMTV. Morning, Nick. Morning, Rob. Morning, Nick. Thank you for the introduction. We've had so many questions come through, guys. We're going to kick this straight off because if we're going to try to cover this through in 30 minutes, we, we, we've got a challenge on our hands. So, Rob, I'm going to ask you three, three questions straight off the bat. What will happen if a property is sole subject to contract today? What are the circumstances when property transactions can complete under self-isolation and what deals can happen now? Okay, well, before I begin, I'll have to do the usual lawyer thing of qualifying my answers and comments. I have guidance available, some of it's vague, some of it even contradictory, and my views are there for most of my views. Um, others may have a different take on things. So I'm going to take this straight from, from the guidance that, that I've seen. If a property is sold subject to contract at the moment, then subject to the practical difficulties caused by this current period of stay at home measures, the government prefers that to lockdown, the transaction can proceed to exchange and in some cases even complete. The completion part is probably easier to comment on and the practicalities of getting to exchange. However, it does depend on whether or not you're reading the government guidance dated the 26th of March or the health protection coronavirus restrictions England Regulations 2020, also dated the 26th of March. The former says, there is no need to pull out of a transaction, but we all need to ensure we're following guidance to stay at home and away from others at all times, including the specific measures for those who are presenting symptoms, self-isolating or shielding. Prioritizing the health of individuals and the public must be a priority. Where the property being moved into is vacant, then you can action, although you should follow the guidance in this document on home removals, which I'll get to in a second. Where the property is currently occupied, we encourage all parties to do all they can to amicably agree alternative dates to move for a time when it is likely that the stay-at-home measures will no longer be in place. Home buyers and renters should, where possible, delay moving to a new house. If you've already exchanged contracts and the property is currently occupied, then all parties should work together to agree a delay or another way to resolve this matter. In the new emergency enforcement powers that the police have been given, there is an exemption for critical home moves in the event that a new date is unable to be agreed. If moving is unavoidable for contractual reasons and the parties are unable to reach an agreement to delay, people must follow the advice on staying away from others. Now, the advice provided for the removers is, is as follows. Removers should honor their existing commitments where it's clear that the move can be done safely for the client and their own staff, and it's clear that the moving date cannot be moved. 
removers should follow the latest government guidance, which currently states that work carried out in people's homes can continue, provided the tradesperson is well and has no symptoms. It's important to ensure government guidelines are followed, including a, a maintaining a two meter distance from others, not easy if you're carrying a fridge, and washing their hands with soap and water and sanitizing often. So that's the guidance advice. However, the regulations under clause 6L, restriction on movement, says something different. During the emergency period, no person may leave the place where they're living without reasonable excuse. So it's no longer critical, it's now reasonable. Um, and a reasonable excuse includes the need to move house where reasonably necessary. When pushed further on this, on the 31st of March, a spokesperson for MHCLG said, People are free to continue to buy and sell homes. Parties can continue with the legal process, including the exchange and completion of contracts for the purchase of properties. However, government guidance is clear that home buyers and renters should, where possible, delay moving to a new house while measures are in place to fight coronavirus. Simultaneous exchanges and completions do not alter this advice. People are advised not to enter into contracts which might create an obligation which would conflict with this public health advice. So that's as clear as mud then. However, if in doubt, make sure that any client who wants to move, particularly into an occupied property, is satisfied that and is telling you that their move is critical or tell them the police may come knocking on their door. Thanks, Rob. Um, fairly comprehensive um, response to those three questions. Appreciate that. Next question again is for you, Rob. We'll continue on this theme. What can we do about clients who need to sign mortgage deeds? <coughs> but they are in isolation with only family members and cannot find witnesses? Uh, well, I've received reports of neighbours witnessing the signing of documents by simply standing outside of a property and witnessing through a partially opened or even closed window. Um, however, in view of a, high, a recent High Court decision in Word, Wood versus Commercial First 2019, some people are now suggesting that lawyers can arrange a FaceTime or similar, similar video call with their clients and watch them sign the document, which they return to their lawyer and they can witness on receipt. Having looked at the case, I'm not so sure though. The case was not about video witnessing, but about a witness who was present signing themselves at a later date. So they saw the, the signer sign, but they signed later. The court in that case held while it was necessary for the person executing the deed to sign in the presence of a witness, there was no additional requirement for the witness to sign in the presence of the executing party. So does witnessing the signing via video mean the person witnessing actually witnessed in the presence of witness? I'm not sure it does. Okay. Given the potential... Whoever's going to test that one, good luck with it. <laughs> Another question for you, Rob. Um, you're a very popular man. Given the potential dangers, should we advise clients to not exchange at all? If they do exchange, should it only be with a coronavirus, coronavirus rider? Um, if a client's ready to exchange, I think it would be very wise for the contract to include the coronavirus rider in the terms of the recent new variation agreements come into force. This agreement was recently drafted by a number of parties, including the Law Society, and can be used as a draft specimen agreement. It's reviewed for use in very limited circumstances where contracts have already been exchanged, but completion has not taken place. The draft agreement is intended as a starting point only to enable lawyers to identify some of the issues which justify delaying completion of transactions where contracts have already been exchanged. Okay. Thanks again, Rob. And another one for you, Rob. If a client decides that they want to exchange but do not want the rider or even with one, does this become a notifiable circumstance given the potential of a future claim? Oh, that's a big question and I'll repeat my disclaimer at the, at the beginning before I answer that. I would say not necessarily, but obviously you must keep a clear record of the advice you've given um, to the client and the client's subsequent instructions to proceed, sorry, to proceed irrespective of that advice. Keep a clear paper trail or email trail, uh, but I don't think you know to notify your insurer just yet. Thanks, Rob. Two more questions, Rob, um, before we move on to Mike. Um, the, 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 the speaker, though, the 
the guest has, has Rob had any feedback as to how the draft variation agreement and clauses are working in practice? And what does the future look like for new build agreements when we come out the other side? Um, what are the developers doing now? Well, the variation agreement, um, bearing in mind that it was only prepared at the end of last month, it probably is too early to say how it's working in practice. Rightly or wrongly, though, it seems that most transactions still completing are doing so on a simultaneous exchange and completion basis. However, when the agreement was sent out a couple of weeks ago, I received very few questions on the content, indicating to me a reasonably widespread acceptance of it, in principle at least. I believe it's being used not massively because I think the number of transactions that proceeding have now stopped anyway or slowed down anyway. With regard to developers, um, again, an interesting question. I've not received a lot of feedback on this from my members yet. I believe most of the developers have stopped building and as a result, uh, I guess there are very few new build properties actually due to complete. I did have a quick response from a member this morning saying most developers are being reasonable and agreeing new variation clause and not actually forcing um, uh, purchasers to complete in the uh, stay at home um, times that we're in now. Thanks Rob. Mike, have you got anything to, to add that kind of nice segue into the estate agency world sure. on new build? Do you have a view? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, the new build market is, a, is an interesting one. I think Rob is right. Most of the major developers have now obviously come off of their sites under construction. Um, but there is a fair amount of stock uh, property out there, property that is finished, is built. Um, and I think we are still seeing a number of completions take place, particularly if it's, say, a first time buyer uh, buying, obviously, a brand new home is an empty home. So um, those sort of transactions, um, often on a simultaneous exchange and completion basis so you don't have the need for um, these clauses that uh, revolve around delaying completion um, but clearly it's beginning to slow up and as we go on week by week um, the sort of follow-through of what was in the pipeline is diminishing because there's less and less getting added into uh, the pipeline pot and I think um, going back on a couple of the other points, the key ingredient here for everybody is, is good communication between all the parties and agreement. Um, there's been a couple of reports in the last few days, I've done my own anecdotal research, that shows that actually the amount of transactions that have collapsed so far from a sales pipeline um, due to the circumstances is actually relatively minimal. And some of those may well have collapsed anyway and are using the current scenario as a bit of an excuse to sort of wrap the decision um, so at the moment across the you know the country the evidence tends to suggest that we've not seen more than about a 10 percent um, fall out of, uh, of transactions from sales pipelines now clearly all the time they're in a pipeline and not yet exchanged um, or whatever they're, they're vulnerable and the longer it takes the you know the greater the risk but the general feel is everybody is taking a view that we're in the same boat and providing everybody is positively looking for solutions and communicating, the vast majority of people are hanging on in there. As I say, time will tell. If time goes on, if there is fear of house prices falling, if there's um, huge fear of unemployment numbers being uh, significant, things may change. But if we come out of this in some limited way in the next month or so, then maybe, um, and we start to see a little bit of a build up, um, I'm not sure that the um, current scenario is going to see a house, you know, house collapse. No, I, I, one of my members emailed me this morning and said, we're still busy, but completions have dropped off from 35 to 30, 14, eight planned this week and one next week. So it, it, is, it is drying up. Um, and as you know, Mike, there was a survey, um, some survey results printed in Property Industry Eye this morning. Um, and they said in the survey, gauging the sentiment of intentions of home movers since restrictions on movement began, 75% of those who were at the early stage of planning uh, a home move indicated they still wanted to move as soon as possible, with a further 18% 18, 18 still hoping to move later this year. So the need and desire, is, as you say, Mike, is still out there. Yeah, I mean, the reasons why people move house are still largely relevant. Um, we're going to see a change as we go forward, because I'm sure we're going to see um, some of the other um, elements come you know, more into play, sort of, as sadly, death. Um, divorce, 
Um, you know, I mean, some of us are locked up with the missus at the moment, you know, and that I'm going to retrain as a divorce lawyer during this period because I think that could be a growth market. Um, but basically, distressed sales, death, divorce, debt, these sort of things, unfortunately, are probably going to uh, come to the fore um, in a post-corona environment. So, um, you know, and the reasons why people were moving, we were seeing, um, we were actually seeing a slight uplift in the market prior to uh, the, you know the lockdown um, and that was you know whether it was the boris bounce or whatever but you know 1.2 million transactions last year i'm afraid we're probably going to see that number half with the dip this year assuming we can start to move out of it in the autumn um, but the underlying demand is still clearly there the question is mike will there be enough estate agents left will there be enough removers left will there be enough financing firms out there the next three, six there will years. always be enough estate agents left. I mean, isn't it? You know, it's a bit like you're never too far from a rat, isn't it? Is what they say. Um, so your, your, um, your word's not mine, Mike. I wouldn't dare say that about an estate agent. So the the, re the reality is, um, you know, the, the the number of estate agents will clearly reduce, as I'm sure the number of conveyances will um, reduce. Some of that, quite frankly, was probably um, necessary anyway. Um, because the market was being spread out too thinly amongst too many players. So I do think we will see a significant reduction in the number, not necessarily the number of businesses, but certainly the number of outlets um, of estate agencies in, in, in the, uh, the post-corona environment. And in the reality is, every time we have some sort of disaster, and this one is clearly you know, a very significant crisis, um, we see more, more businesses go bust on the upturn than we do on the downturn. And, and that's because they suddenly haven't got the resources, and we can perhaps talk about this in a minute, but they haven't got the resources and the planning and whatever to come out of the situation. At the moment, everything's about mitigation and battening down the hatches. But at some point, you've got to be able to move forward and get the thing going again. And that's where I think we'll see the, the dropout in players in the market. Yeah, I, I would imagine there's a significant number of law firms who are still using um, post and possibly don't have case management systems who are going to suffer, won't be able to work from home as easily as the, as the more modern firms. Um, so I think there will be, unfortunately, or fortunately, a natural cull, as you say. Well, I think part of that also, you know, if, you know, if you're an estate agent, if you're, um, whether you're, you know, whether you're on a basis with law firms, a referral basis, which is, is remunerated, or whether it's just a, a friendly referral to your local lawyer or whatever, one of the things you are going to be taking note of is how you you've been working together during this period of time how easy it was how cooperative it was whatever and clearly everybody from you know law, law side state agency side other players in the marketplace are going to be reviewing their entire operations every line of their operations and clearly people aren't going to continue to work with people who they feel have let them down or who haven't been able to uh, meet the requirements during a difficult period yeah i think also what Sorry, Nick. Sorry, sorry, Rob. I just wanted to touch on that point with, with Mike. Um, looking at the, the role of the estate agent at in, in, in this moment in time, um, do you think um, now that they're working from home, do you think this is actually going to impact the way they work in the future? Well, I think um, there's a lot of talk, of course, of, you know, uh, the, the decline of the high streets and this doesn't just affect estate agents I mean I think it's you know the reality is that footfall in in our high streets is has greatly reduced year on year for about the last 15 years um, and that that so that this paradigm shift of the way that things are moving um, was already happening clearly a crisis like the one we're in at the moment is going to accelerate those changes um, so we you know we were already seeing perhaps a little bit of movement away from the high street or a reduction in the number of outlets people talk about hybrid models online models self-employed umbrella models you know there's a name for everything um, and we will see um, those changes continue even within established traditional um, operators with high street networks um, do they really need all of those high street offices? Maybe they, they are a 24-7 advertising hoarding. But if nobody's coming in, if you could operate from somewhere much cheaper, and I think one of the big things that this is showing all businesses is you have to try and reduce your fixed costs. As a business, it's your fixed costs that are the killer. You know, and that usually is people, 
people are largely a fixed cost. Now in a self-employed model, that is much, much less so, but premises and to a degree, some marketing costs. And everybody, agents in particular, are reviewing every one of these lines or should be at the moment. And I'm not sure when we get back to some degree of normality, the picture will look the same as it did before we entered the crisis. In fact, I'm damn sure it won't. I, I got a little bit of a roasting in the Law Society Gazette the other day when I suggested that the firm should look at fixed costs and cut out anything that wasn't essential. Um, but, you know, three, four weeks on, firms are now doing that. They probably should have done it earlier. The only thing I would say, of course, is keep your Bob League group membership. <laughs> Absolutely, Rob. But that's a, that's a value add. But people need to, um, you know, make sure that they, you know every line of their expenditure is a value add to their business. If we take the estate agency sector, after people, the biggest cost for most firms is marketing. It's and it's the, most of that spend these days goes on the portals, on Right Move, Supla, on the market, and a couple of others. Um, a lot of estate agents are on all three. I don't see that continuing. And in fact, I've done a survey that shows that um, post-corona, only half of estate agents will be advertising on more than one portal. So there's yeah. going to be a huge change there. Now, Rightmove have an enormous profit margin and they're not best loved by, their, by the estate agents as a generalisation. Um, but my extrapolation of the figures would see them losing somewhere around about a third of their estate agency subscribers. But the drop for Zoopla and on the market is also significant. It won't kill Rightmove, although it will seriously damage them, but it could be fatal to Zoopla and uh, on the market unless they address the issue. Well, there's a bit of a battle going on at the moment, isn't there, I think, from what I read in the estate agency press. I think the other issue that, that agents, lawyers uh, and others will have in, in this profession, in this business, is when it does start again, you, you don't get paid immediately. You have to wait for, for completion which could be another two or three months away after the markets um, come back to life. Yeah, well, what we're going to see, of course, potentially, if we hold on to our sales pipelines as lawyers, as estate agents, we're going to get to a point where things can happen. And hopefully we'll see a little boost, a little uplift, a little surge of exchanges and completions because the pipeline will all be ready or largely ready to go through at that point. But because it's not been replenished during this period to anywhere near the same degree, a lot of businesses are almost going to be, they'll have a little boost for a month or two, and then they're almost starting from scratch again. And, you know, my big thing with my clients is about that plan for how you come out of this and go forward, because um, there is going to be a second wave. We don't know, I mean, furloughing, the government is putting a lot of money into things like furloughing and that. But of course, once everybody's back to work, will that continue? Well, there's an argument to say it can't continue but then firms are almost starting again but without the support mechanisms that we've currently got now you and i rob know that there are various stakeholders in the industry um, talking to government writing to government um, looking at what support mechanisms they can put in place to help us out of this now um, and it's right that those sort of things should be being discussed because um, we could and this is one of the reasons i said that we'll see more firms go belly up in the upturn than we do in the downturn because a lot of the support mechanisms could be pulled um, and we need to find a way now whether it's things like stamp duty holidays or things to encourage the market but also some sort of prop up possibly in the way business operate because cash flow is going to be an issue huge issue yeah you're right there are a number of industry stakeholders at the moment uh, getting together and talking and um, approaching government uh, what can be done in the future to boost the housing market as quickly as possible. I think in addition to that, um, maybe we're looking at a situation when uh, a property goes on the market, the seller should also instruct the conveyancer on day one, we're almost going to say the hit word, um, and start getting a pack ready so that you're not wasting that vital two, three, four, five weeks um, when the pack can be put together uh, i.e. AML checks, etc., can be done. And well, Rob, I've been advocating that for 20 years, mate. Um, so, you know, and of course, having set up Conwell's Home Conveyancing back in whenever it was, 2000 or whatever, um, that was part of the reason. The, the, you know, fine, there was referral fees and all of that sort of thing. But actually, what it did at the time was it took two and a half weeks off the average length of our transaction. 
which at the time was 13 weeks, and it brought it down to about 10 and a half. Now, obviously, transaction times have sadly increased over the 20 years since, um, but we, we ended up turning our pipeline five times a nice. year instead of four. What a difference that made to the bottom line. And the, yeah. the, the same principles apply now. Jan, yeah. there's, there's five minutes left. Sorry to inter interrupt to, uh, uh, our guests. If there are any questions, please use the chat facility so we can try to get as much out of this as we possibly can. There are two questions that I think we, you, you kind of skirted around, guys, but there's two questions I'm going to ask both of you. How should agents and, and, and law firms manage buyers and sellers over the course of the next two months with a lack of any meaningful update? And more importantly, will a level of collaboration across the sector continue after we're through this? Go on, Mike. Um, first part of that, um, communication, I mentioned it earlier. It you know, everybody is in the same boat here. Um, I think, you know, positive but not stupid conversations uh, with people. This is where the estate agents perhaps historically have been better than the law firms in terms of communicating, um, you know, one-to-one -one with clients, with buyers, with sellers. Um, as I said, the underlying reasons why people want to move haven't changed. There may be some, you know, some changes in the emphasis and whatever in the coming weeks. Um, but we've got to talk together. We've got to um, be solution conscious, um, not not problem conscious. And in regards to um, the collaboration, um, collaboration um, within the estate agency sector, there are a lot of affinity groups who are working together. Um, umbrella organisations, whether that's Long Res, which is largely a London-based uh, sort of thing, the Guild, but these sort of groups could come to the fore um, more, particularly with the sort of affinity groups. You're running these uh, webinars, um, Nick, and, and, and other people have been doing the same. I've been doing it within the estate agency sector with my clients. So there is a lot of goodwill between one party and another at this moment in time of course it will become dog eat dog again at some point in the future but hopefully some better understanding of each other's positions will result in uh, more collaboration going forward yeah i agree and i think also it's it's, it, it's vital for the estate agents and the lawyers to keep reading their industry press and keeping up to date that way because you know estate agents today property industry i will keep going the law society gazette will keep going i'll keep sending out my bulletins you'll keep doing your stuff mike we lots of ways to keep up with what's going on. Thank you. We've had a question come in from uh, from from a gentleman we we all know very well. Thanks. So thank you, Eddie. I'm not surprised. It's Eddie. <laughs> My uh, Eddie's question is: um, How long do you guys think the property market can uh, last uh, uh, last starved of cash? Figures I've heard range from two to six months. Is there much fat in the industry or are we already too lean and mean? Well, let me, let me jump in there then. Uh, morning, Eddie. Um, the, not everybody is going to survive. That's, I, mean, I said this earlier and um, the scenario is that the longer it goes on, less people will survive in the industry. And uh, that's, that's sadly just the, 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 the way it is. Um, Businesses really do need to be planning. Um, they need to be, you know, taking a long, hard look. We've all, as individuals and as businesses, probably taken costs out of our daily expenditure um, that we don't need to have. And businesses need to reshape and replan. Um, there will be some fantastic opportunities coming out of this. We're still a home-owning democracy, plus there's the rental market. Yeah. Um, so there will be opportunities and in fact of course if there's less players then the opportunities for those that remain potentially are even greater um, I've no idea how long uh, it can last I've personally had to re, you know rejig my business plan to, to you know if you like survive this year um, and I'm confident that I can do that hopefully people can do the same but um, no we will see uh, we will see a dropout uh, I'm saying 25% um, of outlets will close if we come through this in the next and we're back running almost to normal by the time we hit um, sort of late summer early autumn if it goes on until next year then that figure will be much greater in my view I, th I, th I think you're right Mike. I think it's also survival of the fittest and the most modern here they're the ones we're going to get through this the easiest but don't forget a lot of um, conveyancers and property lawyers are in a good position because they don't just do conveyancing Fortunately, wills are up, probates up, 
uh, lasting powers of attorney are up. So there is other income streams for most conveyancing firms, but not all of them. That's a valid point. And for estate agency, you know, this is largely hitting the sales market. I mean, it's hitting the lettings market, but it's really damaging the sales sales market and um, the sales market is the lumpy business the big fees but it's individual transactions most estate agents but not all have some form of lettings operation where they probably if they've got it on a fully managed basis have a portfolio which is generating revenue on a monthly uh, rolling basis um, it may be down that may have some issues with tenants not paying and various bits and pieces but nevertheless it doesn't mean that there's no income coming in so spreading the risk eggs and baskets, all of that sort of stuff. Some people are going to get a very hard lesson. Others I just say quickly, Nick, and I'm not sure you, if you want to, Mike, if anybody wants to email me a question, um, rh at boldgroup.co.uk. Now, we yeah. just, I was going to wrap up, Rob. Thanks for that. Is that. How do people contact you, Rob? It's rh at bold legal. Bold group. Bold group. Co.uk. And Mike? Inquiries at integra-ps.com. Brilliant. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you so much today. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, audience, thank you as well for, for, for joining the, uh, the discussion. Um, please um, uh, like the TMTV LinkedIn page and you will then get to see uh, a playback of this uh, that you can share with your friends and, and, uh, and uh, colleagues uh, in the industry. But once again, thanks, Mike. Thank you, Rob. And, uh, can, I just, can I just say one thing, uh, uh, Nick, yes, and that is just to, for everybody, remember that history is written by the victors. So therefore, make sure you're planning for victory and we'll be, cut, we'll be fine. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks very much, everybody. Take care. Okay, thanks, Nick. Thanks, Mike. Bye. Cheers. Cheers, guys.